Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Gastonguet, VP at Clarius. We're thrilled to see you all here. Today's webinar is breaking records with over 4,400 clinicians who registered from all corners of the world. Good morning, good day, good evening to you. We'd like to thank Ezra and Outpatient Surgery for helping us send out invitations. In a moment, we'll welcome back by popular demand, Dr. Greg Hickman, as he shares his proven techniques in today's webinar entitled, Expert Ultrasound Guided Blocks for Knee Surgery, IPAC, Genicular Nerve and Abductor Canal Techniques. Innervation of the knee joint and surrounding tissue is complex. Depending on the surgery and rehab plan, only select nerves need to be blocked and others avoided. A 30-year expert, Dr. Hickman, will soon share a recent procedure captured on video to provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to use ultrasound-guided blocks to minimize pain following knee surgeries while preserving sensory and motor function of the leg and foot. Let me first introduce you to your host. Shelly Gunther is an experienced sonographer and works as clinical manager at Clarius. She has over 25 years of experience as a clinical ultrasound expert with deep experience in both general ultrasound and echocardiography. At Clarius, Shelly is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice. By delivering practical webinars like today's, and video tutorials on our Claris classroom, which now feature over 200 on-demand videos. Please join me in welcoming Shelley. Hi, Shelley. Hi, Janice. Thank you Hi. so much and uh, welcome everybody. Wow, this is a record-breaking attendance for us today for this webinar. It's uh, really great to be hosting another um, webinar covering a very popular topic, ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. And so nice to welcome back Dr. Greg Hickman. So in this session, Dr. Hickman will be demonstrating blocks targeted for the knee um, and knee surgery. And in this particular case, uh, the surgery is an ACL repair. Ultrasound um, use for nerve blocks, um, nerve blockade has really increased over the past decade. And in at least in North America has become the standard of care. And I find it really interesting after the last few Clarius webinars that I've been a part of, how anesthesiologists are continuing to customize their ultrasound guided techniques as they become more and more familiar with ultrasound and how and where it can be most useful and effective. Using ultrasound really is all about performing safer injections and providing the best pain control for patients. And for the knee, it's important to preserve motor function for better rehab. Reduced opioid consumption post-operatively is a bit of the icing on the cake as well. Now, we always like to set the stage for our, our webinars by seeing what's out there in the literature. And as ultrasound is becoming more commonplace all over the world to improve blocks, there's no shortage of information about ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia compared to landmark guided blocks. And this really speaks to how valuable a tool um, ultrasound has become and as well what, how common it is in practice and in residency or teaching programs. So let's uh, bring up the first slide here. Um, you know, traditionally when imaging was required, um, blocks were performed under fluoroscopy. And this article questioned whether this method was superior to ultrasound guidance when performing genicular nerve blocks. And the authors did determine that ultrasound guidance may be superior to fluoroscopic um, guidance because obviously with ultrasound, there's no radiation exposure. Um, so I, you know, kind of makes sense that that's the way that you would go. For the next um, article, uh, it was a recent study from the Brazilian Journal of Anesthesiology and it's and is relevant to this webinar as it discusses combining the IPAC block with the adductor canal block under ultrasound guidance. And this was compared to a combination of femoral and superior popliteal sciatic blocks. Um, the former technique resulted in higher quadriceps strength um, uh, score, um, resulting in patients getting up and moving sooner. And finally, the last slide, uh, the last study I looked at was um, you know, as, as the use of ultrasound for guiding procedures increases, so is the need for better and more consistent education um, so that ultrasound can be in the hands of more and more regional anesthesiologists. And though the abstract here is focused on upper limb blocks, the consensus aims to produce standards for imaging during regional blocks. And what really, what better way to do this um, than with wireless ultrasound? 
So we'd uh, gonna bring up a little poll. We have uh, practitioners from all over the world with various ultrasound skill levels. Um, so before we um, officially welcome Dr. Hickman, um, I, uh, let's put up this poll. You know, in our last webinar with Dr. Um, Hickman, we conducted a poll asking what is seen as the risks and limitations to blind injections for anesthesiologists. And most of the attendees responded with either inaccurate injections or hitting a vessel, nerve, pleura, et cetera. Um, all very good reasons for, uh, for you know, adding ultrasound to the practice. So today we'd like to know, in fact, if you're using ultrasound to guide your procedures, and if so, how often? Do you use it daily, occasionally? Not yet, but you're still considering or hopeful or optimistic about using it, um, or you don't think you'll ever use ultrasound in your practice. So let's leave a couple of seconds here. Three, two, one. And wow, uh, a large percentage of people are using it at, um, daily and at least occasionally. So that is fantastic. Um, so I think everyone here is going to find the content today very helpful and informative. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, after today's webinar, those that aren't using it are going to be adding ultrasound to their practices because um, it can be really beneficial to you and your patients. Now, we'd like to say our presenter is a double black belt in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. Dr. Gregory Hickman is the medical and anesthesia director at the Andrews Institute Ambulatory Surgery Center in the lovely Gulf Breeze, Florida. He is certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology and the American Ap Academy of Pain Management. And Dr. Hickman is also the co-founder of popular regional guided anesthesia ed education website, blockjocks.com, which teaches doctors, nurses, and patients around the world. So Dr. Hickman, without further ado, I'll uh, let you take over. Thank you so much, Shelly and Janice, for having me back with Clarius to talk about uh, lower extremity blocks this time. We went over upper extremity last time, and uh, I really appreciate all of our uh, folks tuning in um, from all over the world, uh, especially over in, in Europe, because I know it's really late there, and uh, some people are staying up late to watch this, and it was good. It was really great to get a chance to meet a few people over at Ezra when I was uh, in Greece a couple months ago for the Ezra meeting, which is always a good meeting. So um, let's talk about lower extremity blocks here today. And what we're going to talk about, we'll talk about the IPAC block. Uh, it's, it's been around a few years. People are getting more common and familiar with that. A genicular nerve block, which is a little newer. And a doctor canal connect catheters, which we place for our major knee surgeries. Um, actually, we're femoral triangle catheters to be anatomically precise. And then something new for everybody to, uh, to see that I just learned about myself not too long ago. As uh, some of you know, I'm, I'm in the U.S. and I've been a private practitioner here for uh, about 30 years. I spent 20 years in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, started working with Dr. James Andrews in 1992. Uh, he's the world's most renowned orthopedic sports medicine surgeon. And so I've met a lot of uh, interesting athletes, famous athletes around uh, over the years from around the world. Uh, in 2007, we built the Andrews Institute here in, in down in Gulf Breeze, Florida. It's kind of hot and humid these days uh, and rainy, getting a lot of rain. And, and as you stated, uh, we started up block jocks a few years ago. So let's talk about the IPAC block. Um, uh, the IPAC stands for infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee. And my good friend uh, Sanjay Sina brought this to our attention. He's the one who came up with this idea and presented it at the ASRA meeting in 2012. Uh, and what he, his goal was, he wanted to block the terminal branches of the obturator and tibial nerves in the posterior knee space, uh, thus sparing the main trunks of the tibial and common perineal nerves, uh, avoiding the motor blockade that you get with those, which the most concerning for our surgeons especially is gonna be a foot drop. They don't like to see a foot drop after a total knee uh, or after, and, and some don't, don't wanna see it after an ACL. Some not as much on the ACL, but definitely the total knee. The surgeons don't like to see a foot drop because that's very concerning to them. So Sanjay's idea was to inject between, as it said, between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee. So 
he's coming from medial to lateral here in this direction and trying to get between the artery and vein and the knee. As you can see, here's the perineal nerve, the tibial nerve. So those branches are coming down into the posterior aspect of the knee. On the medial side, you got the obturator branches coming in. Um, and so we're just trying to infiltrate that area. There are a couple approaches uh, to do this. Sanjay, he'll show, he describes the medial approach and I am more, uh, more familiar with the lateral approach. I like the lateral approach a little better and I'll explain that why in just a second. But here's Sanjay's approach. Here's the initial look. He has the knee kind of frog leg, rolled out a little bit, bent just a touch, uh, kind of up on a little towel there. And here's the, his look. He's got the femur and he's using a curvilinear probe. He's got the femur, the popliteal artery here, and he's gonna come in in this direction. Well, actually he's gonna slide down, get a little closer to the knee and then slide a little more medial and inferior and ends up in this area here with the femur, the popliteal artery. And as you can see, a really steep trajectory of his needle here. So his needle's going in right here, right next to the probe and basically going straight down right next to the femur. That's the approach he, he likes and has used. I like more of a lateral approach where we bring, let, leave the patient supine, put the, the foot up on a, a male stand with a pillow, cushioning the ankle, and then we'll come up posteriorly with our probe and come in laterally uh, with our needle. So either way, we're gonna be injecting in this area between the popliteal artery and, and the bone here, the uh, posterior capsule, the knee. I'm looking, trying to find the tibial and perineal nerves probably here and here. So we, when I do, the one thing about my approach, I've got to come down deep and not come near the probe, whereas Dr. Seen is going to come right next to the probe because he's going to be really steep on his approach. So we're going to come in out here with this approach, and we're going to stick our needle right in here. This, there's a video. Um, at first, you saw the condyles of the femur, and then we went just a little more proximally. Uh, and you can see the, there's the condyles again. And we slide in here right and left, and then slide up till we get the flat femur, and we have a space where we can inject there. Now, here's our injection. Here's my needle coming in from uh, left to right. And you can see it just straight in across right there. We're injecting in this area. We've already injected over here. We'll put five cc's here, five here, and five here. Some usually 15 to 20 cc's is what we will use, sometimes 15, sometimes 20, and just coat across through. There's the needle again. You, you see my needle easier than Dr. Cena's approach. That's the reason I like it. And you and you seem to have a little bit more real estate to work in there. Um, uh, behind the yeah, tibial think, artery there. Mm -hmm, exactly. So uh, our friends over at the Oshner Clinic in New Orleans did a study back in, in the published in 2017, looking at the IPAC and, and, and their total knee patients and did analysis of 106 patients, trying to see if this was really a helpful approach. And what they looked at, they compared femoral nerve blocks versus femoral nerve plus IPACs versus adductor canal blocks versus IPACs. And basically the IPAC uh, block reduced opioid consumption, whether it was with the femoral nerve block or the adductor canal, it greatly reduced opioid consumption versus just doing the femoral block. So there, there must be some result here, it must be doing some good. And then when they compared the adductor canal versus the femoral nerve block, they showed, plus the IPAC, they showed equivalent analgesia with the adductor canal uh, improved physical therapy performance and earlier hospital discharge. So they showed the benefits of really an adductor canal plus an IPAC versus a femoral nerve block and an IPAC. So let's take a look at it here. Uh, on one we filmed, uh, we're going to start off here, get our screen a little deeper. It's a little deep, deeper than a lot of our blocks. Get the gain up a little bit there. Uh, we're going to come down. Am I going to start with the uh, condyles or am I just going to go right to it? Um, that was a little bit of the condyle right there. 
but now I think I'm going up the leg. Here we go. There's our popliteal artery. Here's a nice uh, posterior femoral aspect of the of the leg here, just right at the knee, just above the knee. And we're going to come in, I think, from the right to the left. A little local in. So, like, watch this. We're going to come way up here, not near the probe. But as you can see, we're one, two, three centimeters deep. There's our local syringe. So we're three centimeters off of our probe coming in up closer to the femur than we are to the probe. And now we'll get our block needle and we'll bring it across here. You can see it come across from right to left on the ultrasound image. And for some reason it doesn't want to go. It's bending on me. There it goes because I want to keep it down here below the artery. And so that's why I'm having a little trouble trying to get it up. There, but closer to the femur. There we go. Now we've got the needle all the way across. Here's the popliteal artery. The needle's over here, we injected medially. We'll pull back a little bit. We're going to inject some more about right here. There we go. See it filling up, the local filling up between the bone and the, and the artery. We'll pull back a little bit more. We'll put some more local right in here. Okay. And then we'll pull out. So we got our tibial nerve here, per perineal nerve here, and their branches coming into the posterior of the knee are coming down this way. And so we're spreading this local around to try to catch those branches as they come into the posterior knee. That's our IPAC block. All right, moving on. So the genicular nerve blocks. So this is something that really was done initially for chronic knee pain, the more the chronic pain doctors was doing, were doing this. Uh, they were using fluoroscopic guidance and bony landmarks. Uh, to go inject in the four areas around the knee. Uh, ultrasound uh, initially wasn't that good, uh, but the, you could sometimes see the vessels associated with the nerve, but it was actually good enough to be able to get uh, appropriate block of the genicular nerve. And now we're using it some, some, some people are using it a lot in their uh, total knees and ACLs. Some are using it sometimes, uh, but it is something new to add uh, and, and to your armamentarium for your, for these knee surgeries. Um, well, the, one of the beauties is that there's no motor blockade. And so that's always helpful when you're doing nerve blocks is not to get nerve blockade uh, or motor blockade. There's four genicular nerves. The one that we seem to uh, have an interest in where we had pain was in the superior lateral aspect of the knee. So we kind of honed in on that one. That's the one that we utilize and we, we block sometimes, a lot of times with our total knees and our ACLs. Uh, the superior medial, we really haven't had much problem there because of the adductor uh, canal catheter we're gonna put in. Our inferior lateral genicular nerve is right next to the perineal nerve. So a lot of people kind of stay away from that one for that reason. And the inferior medial, we just don't seem to have much of a problem down there. So we're, we're, not, uh, we're not going after that one. We have just basically stuck with the superior lateral genicular nerve. Now these nerves, um, uh, most of the literature say it comes from the sciatic origin, from off of the sciatic nerve. Uh, I have seen some conflicting literature to say the superior branches might come off of like the femoral nerve. But uh, I think as a general rule, most people think of it as coming off the sciatic nerve. So let's just take a look at it. Here's the uh, superior lateral genicular nerve. It looks like it's coming off the sciatic nerve out here and getting this area of the knee. And this is the area of the knee with the adductor canal uh, that we don't seem to be getting that much. And, and obviously the IPAC's not gonna get, get it. Um, so this has been kind of helpful in our practice. Here's the superior medial here. It looks like it's coming off the, the sciatic. Uh, some anatomy texts or things I've seen have said this might come off the um, vastus lateralis and get here. Uh, then the inferior medial genicular nerve coming up and then the inferior lateral genicular nerve coming in from the lateral side over here next to our, our fibular nerve or uh, 
common perineal or the recurrent fibular nerve here off of the common perineal nerve. So there is a really in, impressive innervation to the knee. This is just the anterior side. And then you get over here posterior, you get the obturator nerve, the sciatic nerve, and, and, and all this back here. So there's a lot of innervation, a lot of things to block to make a good uh, analgesic for knee surgery. And I tell you, total knees to me is the hardest things to get really good, blocked really well. Uh, so we use a big multimodal approach for them. So here's our superior lateral approach. We're on just above the knee, a little bit to the lateral side. You can see the femur right here on, on the ultrasound image. And we're just gonna come in to the bone and inject really close to the bone. Here you go, we're a little bit lateral, just above the knee, I'm gonna come in right there. Um, there's my fellow from last year. He's got the probe here coming in with the needle. So the needle come down to the bone. We're just going to inject and lift that bone up right there. Here's a picture, uh, real simple. You got the vastus lateralis muscle, and you got the femur coming down, and that's where we're going to be going. Okay. So I'm probably going to come from right to left on this screen, although it's going to look left to right down here. Um, so we're just above the knee, just above the patella, sliding off laterally. And sometimes you can see a little artery down here and the nerve's going to be near it. But really, if you just float that local along that, that femur under the vastus lateralis, we're going to be fine. So putting in a little local there. This block is a, a little bit uncomfortable. It seems to be uh, not tolerated as well as most blocks. Um, patients don't seem to, to care for it sometimes. So we use, we use a good bit of sedation, midazolam, mostly for, to knock out recall. Uh, so the patient just don't remember our unpleasant experiences. Turn my probe around to get my orientation the way I wanted it. So, and this one's sometimes really hard to get the needle lined up. There we are uh, with your probe. It's really hard sometimes. So you can see here. Oh, now I'm coming at this angle. So I got uh, the needle and, and probe in the same orientation with the needle coming from left to right. And there's our injection. You can see just lifting the, the muscle up off the, uh, the femur there, the distal femur. Right in this area down here. So it's a simple block, 10 to 15 cc's. Uh, if you really see the vessel and you think the nerves that area, 10 is plenty. We usually do 15 just to make sure we get it covered because it's kind of just a field general block for us. And uh, that's, that's, that's it for the uh, superior lateral genicular nerve block that we've added to um, our ACLs. So our inductor canal, um, we do a femoral triangle, and I'm going to explain that to you guys. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, in my career. Um, like I said, I've been with a, the, uh, the world's most famous sports medicine surgeon for 30 years. We've been working together. So I've lived through this evolution. Back in the uh, 90s, uh, we used to keep our patients in the hospital for three days with, with an ACL. Uh, and from probably about 98, 99 till 2004, most people were doing those, these as outpatients. And we kind of got forced into that. In 2004, we started going with a single shot femoral nerve block. And then when we opened up here at the Andrews Institute, we started sending patients home. We, we started sending patients home with our femoral nerve catheters. Then quickly jumped on the adductor canal bandwagon in 2012. And in 2017, we moved on on further proximal to the adductor or the femoral triangle catheter. And I'm gonna explain how and why we did that. So mid thigh, most people do adductor canal blocks about mid thigh, about halfway between the knee and the hip. That's typical. We used to do it that way. When you did that, you would see the sartorius muscle and, you, and you'd find the um, artery, the femoral artery, right, what I call just right in the middle of the muscle deep to the muscle, half the muscle on the right side of the artery, half the muscle on the left side of the artery, the saphenous nerve sitting 
right here. If we're coming with this approach, it's going to be right here at nine o'clock to the artery. So, um, as I said, most people started with, with this um, mid thigh uh, approach. We did that for several years. A um, couple of things we, we noticed were we're having significant uh, saphenous neuritis and neuropathies. We had a lot of numbness from the knee to the medial ankle. And some patients would even get a burning uh, pain uh, from, from the, this saphenous nerve getting irritated from the lock at this level. And my uh, good friend, Dr. John Louis Horn at Stanford, we were talking about this and we both were seeing the same complication and we weren't sure why or what to do about it. And but we were talking about how to treat it. And then uh, uh, in 2017, I, one of the folks from Stanford told me that they went up and started doing a more proximal uh, femoral triangle block and catheter placement here, and that their saphenous neuritis went away. And not sure why, but that's all I needed to hear. And I quickly jumped on going more proximal. And again, we saw the same thing. This, this neuritis basically went away. Uh, and that was, that was a huge thing. It was really important to me um, not to have uh, pro football players pl playing with a little numbness on the inside of their lower leg uh, from the knee to the ankle. And, uh, and actually, the other thing I noticed, we, we got a little bit better analgesia. And I think because we were getting the nerve to the vastus, getting a little bit better block on the nerve to the vastus. Now, um, down here, distal thigh, really, we'll you do this sometimes if we're doing ankle surgery. And really, all we want to do is get the saphenous nerve and not the nerve to the vastus. We'll go distally down here and just not get the saphenous here. You can get this with three to four cc's and it numbs up for the ankle surgery on the medial, medial ankle if you're doing that kind of procedure. So I'm going to try to describe that a little bit more and a little differently uh, by looking at the femoral nerve here. So this is the femoral nerve at the level of the inguinal ligament. Okay, so that's like six, seven nerves here all combined in one big bundle. And as you go distally, this thing's going to start spreading out and like a spider here. Laterally, the nerve to the sartorius is going to go off first. Medially, the nerve to the pectineus, pectinea, pectineus is going to come off first. And just below that, here, you're going to see the saphenous and the nerve to the vastus medialis break off medially together. And then they split, and the saphenous nerve comes down this way, and the media, vastus medialis comes down this way. The saphenous is running right next to the artery for the most part here. But when you're blocking, um, when you're blocking at uh, mid thigh here, what you're where you are on this diagram is you're down in this area. So the the saphenous nerve and the nerve of the vast medials are pretty far apart. But if you come up proximally to a femoral triangle, we, we're putting our needle right here between the two nerves. So they're a little closer. And we think we get better spread of local to this nerve than we were doing when we were down here injecting on the saphenous nerve. So that's why we want another reason we've got a little more proximally. And I hope that makes a little, little more sense to some folks as to why we do that. So you can see here's the knee, the hips way up here. And this used to be where we do our mid thigh, Dr. Canal, and we're up much more proximally. As you can see that, that, that look again, more proximal. We're going to turn that probe a little bit oblique uh, because we're going to try to slide our catheter down the leg along parallel to the nerve. So here's our mid thigh, Dr. Canal. This is the look we're looking at. But where we're going to go in this femoral triangle, we're going to slide up the leg more proximally and watch that artery go from here all the way up to this way. So it's going to go posterior and medially uh, under the sartorius. And then your nerves are going to slide up. Your saphenous is still here. But so down here, you got the saphenous here. We don't really see the nerve to the vastus. It's probably out in here somewhere. It might even be out in the muscle. But when you come up more proximally, that nerve to the vastus is probably right in here. So they're pretty close together. So as a general rule, we're coming in this way with our needle. We're going to probably put our needle right here in between the saphenous and the nerve to the vastus. All right, so I'm pretty high. You can see I'm up higher on the thigh. Here's the femoral artery. 
Here's the saphenous nerve. The nerve to the vastus is either here or here. We always use a nerve stimulator. So we know if we get close to the nerve to the vastus, we know where we are. We know the region we're in and, uh, um, and we, we back up and uh, avoid the, the twitch to the nerve to the vastus medialis. So now I've got, I've prepped and draped. I can hide my ultrasound under the drape, reach through the drape. I'm still sterile. I don't have to put any kind of sterile probe cover on my, on my ultrasound. And I'm holding the, 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 the probe with the drape, using it as the sterile, sterile feel still. So here we come with a little local infiltration. We're gonna come in with our needle, come probably right in here or here uh, and get into the triangle here, or which will go down to the adductor canal. And we just want local in, in this region. So the other thing we're coming in a little bit oblique. So laterally is a more superior and medial is a little more inferior because we want to thread our canal, our uh, catheter down the canal parallel to the nerves and the, and the artery. Um, so here we come. I think I'm going to try to shoot for right there because I think that's vastus medialis nerve right there. And we're just going to pop through this fa fascia of the sartorius. And pop, come on, come on. There we go. I can feel a pop. I can see it there. And I think we're going to start. And then, so now I know we're definitely in this area, not in the muscle. You have to be careful. Sometimes it's hard to see, and, and you want to make sure you're not injecting in this muscle. So this time I'm clearly through the fascia of the muscle, and I can start injecting down here. Let's inject. I think we're already injected a little. We can see this area kind of opening up with local anesthetic. It's going to get the yeah, sound. Yeah, I think we did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind yeah. of missed it there. Um, so big question. First question I know is going through probably three-fourths of the audience is, wow, are you going to get a femoral nerve block from this? Okay, that is possible if you use 20 to 30 cc's of local anesthetic. You, we do 10 to 15 cc's. It's really plenty of local anesthetic in this area. Uh, then we're going to see our catheter come down. I should see it come out right here. There it goes. There goes our catheter. And like I said, we want that catheter to turn and come down the leg parallel to the nerve in the, in the artery. That way, if it pulls back a little, it's still next to the artery and nerve. And, um, and it's still going to be functioning. But back to the, to the local, you use 10 to 15 cc's. There's plenty in this area, and that'll work. And, um, uh, and you won't get a femoral nerve block. And I've done lots and lots of these. You can get close. You can actually track it back with your ultrasound and see it get kind of close, but it stays on the medial side with the saphenous nerve and the uh, nerve to the vastus. So uh, the, you should just still just get those two nerves blocked. Now we're going to check our catheter here uh, with an injection. I can't see my hands now, so I don't know where. So you have the scanner now quite inferior to where, where you injected. So that's where you've threaded the catheter down. Exactly. Excellent okay. question and, and very pertinent. Because like I said, we're going to thread the catheter down the leg. So we're threading it down to try to see where the tip is. And when we do, there are test injection. It's a, it's a test though. There it was. You can see our testos because we threaded it down. We, we want to see it down there and that's where we'll see it um, up in this area. So that was a good pickup. Uh, and that's exactly where we want it to be. Down the leg. Okay. Good. How long does that catheter stay in Dr. Hickman? So we leave ours in four days. Uh, our patients go home, everything, we're an outpatient center. So everybody goes home with their catheters and their pumps. Uh, we use an electronic pump, which gives an intermittent dose and it doses uh, eight cc's every four hours. And the patients can give themselves a bolus dose of eight cc's every two hours. Usually they don't need it. The local lasts four hours. 
And I, I love watching the studies because the studies in the intermittent bolus, they're all doing every two hour dosing and they really don't need to do that. It'll definitely last four hours. And we're using 0.125 bupivacaine. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use 0.2 ropey or 0.125 bupivacaine, you should get four hours with those intermittent boluses and it works really well uh, in our practice. Okay, something new uh, for everybody. Uh, I thought you would like this. I saw this a couple months ago. I was watching a webinar uh, imagine that people watching webinars and, um, an anesthesiologist was talking about the distal superficial femoral nerve branches. And what they, these do is they innervate the anterior distal thigh and knee. And so, um, what we're talking about is the top of the knee here. And they just it sits right to the skin right up here on top of the knee in this area. And so when I was at Ezra in Greece, I had dinner with a really well-known anesthesiologist, uh, uh, academic anesthesiologist, and I asked him, I said, what do you know about these? I just saw this webinar, and I, what do you know about these, these nerves? And he goes, oh, he goes, this is great. So I haven't even told my wife this. She was sitting there, and he, he goes, I haven't told my wife this, but I actually did this to myself about 4 p.m. one day, and the next morning I went to work, and my knee was still really, really numb right on top on the skin. So it's real easy to do. We're, we go down more like you're doing, um, or I like to go down like you're doing just the old mid-thigh ductor canal block. And at that area, you're going to see the sartorius. You got your femoral artery, your saphenous nerve here. And so that's what we're normally used to focusing, at, focusing on, right? Well, if you go just above the sartorius and you look right here, and right here, and right here, looks like little tiny nerves, and they are. They're the little superficial nerves that uh, come up and do the anterior part of the knee and thigh. So it's a real simple procedure. We just come through and uh, inject down in this area, cross through here, and get these nerves. Doesn't take but a oh, couple cc's per nerve or total of about eight to 10 cc's and you can just infiltrate this whole area. So you can see how that opened up the space there. Got that nerve and then we'll come back and get this nerve next, get over here after that. Real simple. Um, now that was our typical patient. So you can see, and we'll show you something here. This is interesting. So we're about a centimeter and a half down to the top of the sartorius. Okay, now this gentleman is an NFL football player that I did last week, and uh, he basically doesn't have that fat layer. His sartorius is right under the skin, um, about what, a third of a centimeter down. So his nerves, you can see here, here, and here are kind of squeezed in there. We're going to see how I injected these here by just coming in and just infiltrating right above the sartorius and just worked my way across. Basically, almost like an eye pack, just infiltrated right across. Yeah. About the, Looks like the, you're kind of just dissecting that tissue plane there. <laughs> exactly. And that local spread and get all of those nerves. So there you go. Uh, I like that now for my ACLs and my total knees. Um, I, I like that block and, and I don't even do the lateral genet, superior lateral genicular right now. I'm just kind of trying and see if, I don't, if this is going to take care of that superior lateral pain and all the uh, superior knee pain that we've been getting uh, with some of our ACLs and, and total knees. So it's, you can try the genicular or you can try this one. This one seems simpler and easier and more superficial. So I'm giving that a go. Now, this is a view from my house. I work right over here. It's the Andrews Institute. And I have a three mile commute, but I just got to get across that bridge and I'm at work over here. And here's our typical sunset. It is, it is a rather beautiful place to, uh, to see. And we're welcome. We love to have people come visit. We provide a two day regional anesthesia preceptorship where people can come in, join us for a Thursday and Friday, see two really busy days of regional blocks and our techniques and our approach and how our nursing system works. And they can get 20 hours of CME by doing that. So if anybody was interested, you can uh, look at uh, just Google 
uh, regional anesthesia preceptorship at the Andrews Institute, then that should take you to the right place, or you can find it on the ASA website calendar. So that should do it for me. Thank you. Go and learn from the best. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Hickman. So I'm just going to do a quick um, kind of live demonstration here. I have a, a model and I'm going to just uh, basically guide you through um, with Dr. Hickman's help, uh, the areas that he discussed uh, for doing the nerve blocks and hopefully I'll be able to point out some of the nerves as well. So just get my screen live here and I'm just gonna decrease my depth. So I've got a L15 scanner here and I'm using the nerve um, pain preset just like uh, Dr. Hickman used. And so I'm right in the kind of popliteal fossa right here. Yeah, I can see your condyles really well, or the one on the okay, right. So yeah. Condyle here, condyle over here. And there's my artery and my vein is on top here. So they're, they're now right. I need to slide a little bit more proximally. Is that correct? Right. Okay, so I'll just go up a little bit higher. And the, let's still, still see the femur here. Yeah, sometimes you have that little bump there. You kind of got to come a little bit of an angle. Um, I just, there we go. There you go. Let's see. There you go, right so, there. Yeah. So my model doesn't have as much um, kind of space between the artery and the and the posterior knee here. So no. is that a common thing? That happens sometimes. It, your your model's probably just a little smaller than the patient I was using. Yeah, and yeah. Smaller patients, obviously, it's going to be a, um, it's going to, um, you know, they're going to be smaller images and smaller space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so in this in this case, I would be coming in from lateral, and I would just inject right into this area right in here. Correct. Okay. Now nope. I've just gone up a little bit higher here. I was probably a little bit too inferior. <laughs> All right, there's my artery there. Okay, so I'm just gonna have, a, have you flip onto your back and we'll look at the area where the genicular nerve would be the superior lateral genicular nerve. So I'm just placing the scanner in the long axis mm -hmm. and just above the patella and a little bit lateral. Right. And so this is the femur right here, this bright white echo. Yep. The vastus lateralis is the muscle right above you. Okay. Or right above the femur. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then you're just going to come right in this area here and inject. Exactly. Okay. Correct. Right. And I, I'm not seeing any obvious vessels right there. I could turn the color Doppler on to see, but um, I think you had mentioned that we just we just don't always see the vessels in that area. Yeah, it's really hard to see for me. Okay. Like I said, this this is a little more painful, and I, that might be another reason I like just doing the superficial uh, femoral nerves versus the. Okay. Okay, so let's head north. And we'll kind of find the mid, mid adductor canal area. So you said to locate the sartorius. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit higher here. Well, it's usually just more medial than you think. Yeah. Okay. Ah, there we go. Yep. You're right. <laughs> okay. Good. So I have femoral artery here. Correct. And then the sartorius is this nice kind of oblong shaped muscle. Mm -hmm. All right. Right up in that plane is going to be your superficial nerves. Okay. So if I decrease the depth here, so this is where you would do the super, superficial nerve injection right in this area. Yeah. Right above that, that fascial plane of the sartorius. Okay. All right. Sometimes you see the nerves. You see a couple in there. And there's a, a little guys, maybe one right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
You don't always see them all very well. You just infiltrate. It's easy. They're pretty tiny, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, and then if we go up a little bit higher, so I'm just going to kind of follow that sartorius muscle and just kind of demonstrate what you what you talked about the um, how we're going to see the the vessel go more to the side of the sartorius muscle. Yeah, more posterior, more medial. Yeah, more posterior, yes. more medial. The vast is coming into view right there. So if you you're starting to see it just about a centimeter away from the artery, see so under the sartorius. So just to the left of the of the artery, you have the saphenous, and then a little further left, you see the sartorius. Right here, the nerve to the vast. That's the saphenous, and then okay. come to the left just a little bit with your point. And I think that's the nerve to the vast is coming in. Ah, uh, okay. That. Okay. Yeah. And as you keep right. further up the leg, you'll see these two nerves get closer and closer out. Yep. Keep them yep. a little further if you can. Actually, they're getting really close. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. 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 Okay, those great. So all areas, this area right here. Them. Yeah, I want to put the needle right in there between those two nerves. Okay. And you said to just rotate the scanner a little bit, um, and then we can watch. Just to bleak it a little bit so the cat yeah, okay. down the head down the leg. Yeah. All right. Good. And then if I oblique it too much more, I'm seeing the vessel in long axis. So we could essentially well, just watch. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, if you're really good, you're really good. You want to watch the catheter thread? That would be impressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's on a slow day, right? <laughs> yeah. You got lots Excellent. of time. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Hickman. So I'm just going to hand it back to Janess. Uh, keep in mind, we've got a little Q&A button down at the bottom and uh, feel free to keep answering or asking questions and we'll do our best to get through um, your questions in a few moments. Thank you, Shelley, for the fabulous live demo. Uh, it's always great to see the HD3 in action. And thank you, Dr. Hickman, for sharing your best practices with us today. We really appreciate that you invited us to join you at the Andrews Institute Ambulatory Surgical Center in Florida to capture real patient cases on videos. And how lucky for us today that you joined us live to walk us through a real patient case. Uh, before we start our live Q&A with Dr. Hickman, here is a quick poll for you um, for attending today. We'd love to help everyone continue on their journey in bringing ultrasound guidance into their practice for regional blocks. So please do complete this poll if you'd like any additional information on our handheld scanners. Um, you can go ahead and ask uh, for pricing information, as it does vary by region, uh, as in Claris is available in over 90 countries worldwide. So please do request a quote and pricing for local availability. Um, you may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features to compare, for example, our high definition handheld scanners to cart-based systems, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, or you can book a live demo one-on-one -on -one that's more interactive. Uh, where you can ask questions. Um, and additionally, you can watch more tutorials uh, with the fabulous Dr. Hickman. So if you'd like that option, we'll send you more blogs and more tutorials. As you complete this poll, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to our new Clearis HD3, the world's only third generation line of portable ultrasound scanners. Now 30% lighter and smaller with an integrated battery, Clearis HD3 delivers best-in-class wireless ultrasound for regional anesthesiology with an easy-to-use app powered by artificial intelligence and connected to the cloud. Today, the Claris HD3 high-definition scanners are available throughout North America, um, in parts of Latin America, throughout Europe, the United Kingdom, um, and in various different regions in Asia-Pac. Um, so please, uh, again, do visit our website if you missed the poll to ask for more information. Our Claris linear scanners are specifically designed to effectively guide regional blocks with superior MSK needle imaging. They deliver several advantages for the nimble anesthesiologists. Claris is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. This best in class imaging is what you need for great tissue and needle visualization as you saw today. You get a clear view of nerves, vascular structures, and other anatomy, and your needle for safe ultrasound guided injections. The secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers, 192 elements, and artificial intelligence that together deliver the image quality only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost. And with AI replacing complex knobs and buttons, it's as easy to use as your smartphone. 
Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for ultra portability in a variety of settings. As you saw, Dr. Hickman carries his iPad and scanner with him uh, from room to room. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way and touching your sterile prep area. And with no wires, Claris is so much faster to clean and disinfect or fully encase in a sterile bag. Only Claris delivers linear scanners with an ecosystem that includes free apps for your iOS and Android devices for unlimited users. Available with our new membership, Claris Cloud is available to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Claris classroom videos with experts like Dr. Hickman and onboarding with a Claris clinician to build your ultrasound skills. And Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. We'll now close off the poll. Three, two, one. Thank you. If you ask for more information, we will get back to you in the coming week. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Hickman and Shelley to answer your questions. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. Shelley, I'll invite you to moderate. Thanks again, Janice. Okay, we have a ton of questions. So if we, uh, yeah, if we don't get to your questions, we'll be responding um, by email, uh, but I'll try and get to uh, through as many as, as we can here. Um, one of the questions uh, that, that's uh, recurring here is, uh, which local anesthetic do you use for IPAC? IPAC, so what we're using is a quarter percent bupivacaine. And uh, like I said, 15 to 20 cc's. And there was a question I saw about IPAC catheters. We don't do IPAC catheters. I don't think the surgeons are going to want it that close to their, their surgical feel. And so we, the posterior pain uh, isn't as significant as the anterior pain with a total knee or an ACL. So I guess if your surgeon is okay with it, you could put an IPAC catheter in. Uh, that's something we have not done. But what we do, especially in our total knees, We'll, uh, we'll do the single shot IPAC and then send the patient home with a muscle relaxer for two to three days. So we found that posterior spasm uh, has something to do with that posterior pain also. So we just have them on a muscle relaxer for a couple to about three days along with the IPAC. Okay, next question. If we did an adductor canal proximal, won't, be, won't we be concerned about motor weakness from vastus medialis weakness? No, you're going to get vastus medialis weakness basically anywhere you do it. Because uh, if you get analgesia from the vastus medialis nerve, which you really need for the anterior medial aspect of the knee, you're probably going to get some motor weakness, depending on your concentration. Uh, so you use a concentration strong enough to make it last a good while, you're probably going to get some motor weakness. Uh, that is just the last 20% of knee extension and a little bit of adduction, but you still maintain your quads, um, you know, the vessus lateralis and the rectus femoris. So you maintain most of your quad strength. Our, my Dr. Andrews goes in the recovery room and has these guys do straight leg root raises in the recovery room. So we still have plenty of quad strength to be able to do the therapy we need to do. I thought the question was going to be, and I know this, you're going to see this question down the line anyway, the, I thought the question was going to be, aren't you worried about femoral nerve weakness, quad weakness, um, which cause you are so proximal. And so that's one of the keys. So when you're doing this block, uh, we use 10 to 15 cc's of volume. And uh, if we're putting in a catheter, we'll a lot of times use 2%, 0.2% ropey. If we're doing a single shot block, we'll use half percent ropey because we want it to last longer. But if you keep your volume low at 10 to 15 cc's, you shouldn't get quad weakness. Now, if you go up to 20 or 30 cc's, then yes, you're going to push right up and you're going to get quad weakness for sure. And, and I know that question is out there. And a lot of people were asked, were thinking that. Um, why do you only give supralateral gen genicular nerve block and not all four uh, genicular nerves? Yeah, because really our, um, our, with our adductor canal and IPAC blocks, our main pain was going to be, was on that superior lateral. Uh, it wasn't, and it wasn't that common. It wasn't like on every patient, but it seemed to be the superior lateral aspect that we would have some pain sometimes uh, with our, with our total knees. With the ACLs, it'd be more just right on top of the knee with the incision. And that's really why I'm starting to like this superficial uh, femoral penetrating nurse 
even better because it gets both of those. So for, for ACL surgery or replacements, do you perform adductor plus IPAC plus superior femoral? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And we put in a catheter. I know a lot of people don't do catheters, but uh, we do leave an adductor catheter in. Okay. And there was a question about uh, difference kind of between bolus versus um, infusion. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was the yeah. question? I, I just, I can't find it here right now. Okay. It's like, it's like, what, what are you, what is your, what is your thought about bolus versus infusion? Like is one better than the other? Right. Well, I'll tell you how in our practice, what we do, if we're doing an interscaling catheter, we run a continuous infusion uh, because we've been doing it for a long time. We run a continuous infusion of two cc's an hour with a five cc demand bolus every two hours that the patient can use every two or four, two hours the patient can use. And that has worked, always worked well. When we went down to the adductor canal, we kind of want to get more spread. And so theoretically we're thinking uh, doing this bolus with a pump that can really uh, do a really fast bolus injection. We'll get more spread of the local. Uh, and so we do it every four hours. That's, that's plenty. I see a lot of people, a lot of studies using every two hours, I don't think you need to do it that soon because the local is going to last longer than that. Um, but I feel like the spread on a femoral or an adductor canal or in our infraclavicular blocks, catheters, we like the ACC bolus every four hours. I know a lot of people, we don't do really any abdominal surgery, but I know people like TAP catheters and QL1 catheters. Uh, there's a lot of talk in that space where people like the bolus and they'll give 10, 15, I think maybe 20 cc boluses in those sometimes every four or six hours. And, uh, and that they want that spread also. So that's kind of the difference between the bolus and a continuous infusion. Great. Okay. Well, we are at the top of the hour here. So just uh, to be respectful of everyone's time, um, I think we'll close it out there. And like I said, we will um, get to your questions in the coming days and I'll just uh, hand it back to Janice to, uh, to close out the webinar. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, and just a friendly reminder that you will all receive a copy of the slides and the webinar recording in the coming days. So please do keep an eye on your inbox for an email with the links. I'd like to thank Dr. Hickman for all of his insights and a very big thank you to all of you for joining us here today. Please do complete our closing survey to provide your feedback as well so that we can bring more educational webinars like today's. You may also like to visit our website to view previous webinars with Dr. Hickman that are now available on demand. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and keep scanning. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.